How many people are we expecting? We have had um, 170 sign up. Oh, goodness, that's good, isn't it? Yeah, amazing. Yeah, so, um, so yeah, we'll, we'll see. We'll see, we'll how, see how, um, how many um, manage to get on. And not one travel claim to pay out for, John. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Okay, so um, I'm going to kick off only because I know everyone's time is precious and it's a couple of minutes after two. Um, so just to point out that the meeting is being recorded. Um, so um, if you don't give your uh, consent for that, then please be aware of that. Um, obviously, if you can keep your phones off, that would be fantastic. Um, and there will be um, spotlights and presentations shown as well. So welcome and good afternoon everyone and thank you for joining us um, at the Life Science Hub Wales and uh, just to make sure we're all in the right place. This is the Wales Innovation Network for Health and Social Care. Uh, my name is Dee Lowry. Um, I'm the Head of Health and Care Engagement at the Hub. Um, I hope you're all safe and well. Um, I am absolutely delighted to join so many of you with us today. Um, we have participants from across social care in Wales all of the health boards and NHS trusts, um, a range of academia, life science industry and, in, and innovation organisations from across Wales and the UK as well. And this network is really is a good opportunity for us to get together in a, in a really collaborative way, um, as is often impossible in our general working day to, to get so many people together from so many different areas um, and even more so um, harder now. As always, we welcome back familiar faces. Uh, we've been running the network since since March 2019 when it was launched by the Minister. Um, we've also seen some of your faces at our recent events during this time, um, such as the Value in Health Week in October, which we did with the National Value in Health team. Um, and more members have come following our um, inaugural value based healthcare specialist interest group for industry, which we launched last week as well. So a warm welcome to familiar faces and a very warm welcome to new faces. Um, I'd like to introduce you all to my colleague Jonathan Morgan, who joined us just before the last, uh, uh, before the first lockdown. Um, so some of you may have been in contact with him. Some of you might not have had the opportunity to meet with him. Um, but Jonathan's going to be uh, leading us through today's session. So Jonathan, over to you. Thanks, Dee. Um, and yeah, good afternoon, everyone. And it is it is amazing to see so many people here today and and, and many of you are, are are new to me um but i i recognize that a lot of you might have been members of the network for some time so it really is great to be able to get everyone together you know in the name of innovation today um when our team came together to start organizing this winter meeting we were we were conscious that it'd been some time since the last meeting of the network and, and whilst covid19 has kind of created substantial pressures and challenges for your organizations, your teams, your patients, innovation and change has, has seen an explosion of interest and activity during this time. So, so we really knew that bringing the network back together, albeit in a different way, um, was extremely important um, for us as a, in Wales at this present time. Um, so um, today's meeting is, is really about developing a base. So it's a, that, a base of understanding around innovation in Wales, um, but it's also about re-establishing this virtual base um, of the network where like-minded people can come together to connect, to learn, to share um, and to shape health and social care in Wales around the innovation space. Um, we have got a really, really amazing agenda today. So we've got some wonderful presenters who are going to be speaking um, in a short, in a sh some short time. Um, we're going to have some time for questions. Um, a little bit later on after the, the speakers have done their um, their presentations. Um, and we're going to be doing a bit of an interaction. So we're going to get you guys to kind of contribute to to, um, to using Menti a little bit later. And, and the reason for that is we we really want to make sure that, um, you know, there's there's interaction from from you as members. And it really helps us understand what we how we deliver and what the membership uh, being a member of the network means to you. 
Um, we are going to be using the hashtag LSHW Innovation. So if you are on social media, then please do use that. And it would be amazing to see some conversations just building on um, Twitter and other social media channels today. So um, and use the chat. So feel free to use the chat to comment, to ask questions. We will be collating some of those questions as we go through the presentations. And there is some time, like I said, at the end for you to ask questions to the presenters. And we'll be picking those out of the chat function. Um, as we go along. Um, so we'll we'll get into the, the presentations and, and it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker. So um, our first speaker is Lisa Trigg, who's the Assistant Director of Research Data Intelligence at Social Care Wales. Um, and Lisa's going to be talking to us about um, some of the work they've been doing on um, understanding the challenge priorities um, for social care um, with their, their service users, their families and some of their staff as well. So. Um, over to you, Lisa. Thanks, Jonathan. Let's just see if the old sharing screen thing works straight away. How are we going, Jonathan? Is that is that up on Brilliant. the screen? Yeah, it looks great, Lisa. Brilliant. OK, so um, hello, everybody, especially to those who know me. Um, so I'm this is a kind of a strange presentation to start off with on a um, well strange in some ways really appropriate in other ways um, to kick off um, a session on innovation um, what I'm going to talk about is how we've gone around gone about setting some priorities in social care um, around questions that are important to um, people with lived experience of care carers and practitioners and and this this kind of reflects a, an ongoing conversation that we have with the life sciences hub and and very many of you um, about what are the important questions and issues that people see are ripe for innovation um, so rather than what can we do to innovate what should we do to innovate what are the things that are really testing people and are important areas for development so what I'm going to do is walk you through a process that we uh, went through very um, recently um, last year with Health and Care Research Wales and with the James Lind Alliance, who some of you might have heard of, um, and to talk about the top 10 priorities that we establish with people living and working in social care in Wales. The first thing I'm going to do, though, so apologies to anyone on the call who is deeply embedded in social care. I'm just going to refresh what we mean by social care because there may be people on the call who are more on the NHS side and aren't as familiar with social care. So um, and also just like to say that if there are people who would prefer these slides in Welsh, um, we will make them available at the end. So um, thank you for um, yeah, just reach out if you need them. So What do we mean by social care? Well, social care is so much more than keeping people out of hospital. And I know we have lots of conversations with our healthcare colleagues, which are, you know, recognise this very much. But equally, there are still conversations we have, which are, is social care really just about um, delaying, uh, avoiding delayed discharges. So it's so much more than just keeping people out of hospital. It's about helping people live independent lives with um, good well-being, whether they're at home or in care homes. Um, social care in Wales is a really big sector. Um, we have 1500 employers, so you can imagine some of the challenges around innovation and development are, are significant. Um, we too have a large workforce of um, over 70,000 people. And my colleagues who, who work on the recruitment and workforce development side counted up there are approximately 65 different roles across the social care sector. Um, and I think this is a lovely collage of some of the work um, that people do with adults um, in Wales. There's also a huge um, amount of work that goes on to support children. So that's um, social care for you. So what's the exercise that we went through? Um, well, you may have heard of an organisation called the James Lind Alliance. What they do is work with organisations, mainly in health, but increasingly in social care, um, to set research priorities, essentially. And this is essentially where this project started. Um, it's a tried and tested method, um, very systematic, very structured. Um, it brings groups together. So for social care, um, we see those as people with lived experience, carers and practitioners um, on an equal footing. So nobody's voice is more important than others. Um, and the James Lind Alliance uh, facilitators go to a huge amount of 
effort to make sure that um, that people do are given an equal voice. Um, and what these groups do is work together to do what they call um, identify evidence and certainties. So, so what are the questions um, that are important to these groups? Um, and then go through a very, very systematic um, process to prioritise those uncertainties and come up with a top 10 list. I'm not going to talk a lot about the process, just to say um, that it's a, a multi-stage process. We have a, you start with a survey, and I think we had 200 respondents from across Wales. Um, the the um, topics that they come up with are then um, are then filtered into potential research questions, and then we have a um, what would be a face-to-face -face workshop. But obviously, last year was as was actually a, a really impressive Zoom workshop. Um, this project was led by Health and Care Research Wales. Just important to say that with um, Social Care Wales as partners, and um, as I said, in association with the James Lind Alliance. So the first thing that we uh, needed to do was come up with a question. Um, to explore with all of these stakeholders. And the overarching question was, how can we best provide sustainable care and support to help older people live happier and more fulfilling lives? So as I said earlier in the, um, on the presentation, social care also looks after, um, works with children who um, need care and support and to be looked after, um, and also um, work extensively with adults between the ages of 18 and 64. But we settled on this um, as a first question to, to have a go at. And, and the reason why this exercise is quite helpful to more than just our research priorities is that the questions we went out to ask people are not really what research would you like done um, around social care in Wales. They're much broader than that. So you can see on this slide the sorts of things that we asked people. And we had really extensive answers from um, all sorts of people from all parts of Wales. Um, is what, what has helped? What could have been different or better? And is there anything else that you'd like us to find out about social care? And on practitioner side, sorry, on the practitioner side, um, we asked what questions should research address to improve health and well-being, and what questions should, should research address to help people live independently. But you can imagine that the sorts of questions people were coming out with um, really span social span um, research, but also more um, intrinsic questions about what we need to do to um, help support better care and support around Wales. Now we came out with the top 10 and I've got them on the next slides. Now I put all, all the 10 questions on the slides, but they're very busy. So I'm gonna pick out just a few. Um, I, I've included the full text in the slides so that this can stand on its own if people are interested in knowing more about those top 10. Um, but I'll just pull out a couple on each slide. So, um, so the way these te top 10 were formulated was essentially through the use of surveys, we, um, had a short list of 15 questions and then we had a full day, it was split over two days, consensus building workshop to um, whittle those down to the top 10 questions. The first question was the most popular, but the way that this process works is very much that those top 10 questions are um, are equal, if you like. They'll all have equal attention in terms of identifying potential research funding or um, or used for other purposes, which I'll come to. So the top 10, um, the first one was, uh, I'll do the first three and then and work through some of the others. The first one was around, does early care planning or regular contact by social care services help prevent problems and result in better experiences for older people than waiting until this, there is a crisis. Now, this was done during COVID, so all of this work was done online. So, you know, there may be some a little bit of bias because of some of the challenges people have had through the COVID-19 pandemic. But this was a very popular question. So would early intervention, would early contact with social care services um, to help to preempt some some of the bigger problems that um, come uh, from a lack of contact. A big one was reducing isolation and stress amongst carers, and you can imagine that's particularly an issue during the pandemic. Um, so there's lots of conversation about that. Um, and how can a big one for all of us on this call? How can health and social care um, 
including the voluntary sector, work together effectively. So they were the top three. I'll give you a quick um, glance at the other seven and, and also, you know, um, these will be on the slides and um, happy to answer questions if you have any. So the early planning, sorry, my screen is frozen. There you go. Um, well, that was the first one. So the other seven included things like how can we tailor social care better to people's needs? The next one, particularly to complex needs. A really big system one is around whether how social care can be funded in a more sustainable way. Um, what barriers to older people experience in accessing services? So um, they were um, four to seven. And then uh, a big one on the workforce around terms and conditions, big one on quality, um, but also one about how can we help people um, to socialise to reduce loneliness and isolation. So those are the top 10 questions. I'll just briefly um, talk about what we do next. Um, and obviously, please do get in touch if you want more information. Um, the report will be available on the JLA website quite soon. It's just being translated into Welsh as we speak. Um, Health and Care Research Wales are working very actively on the research side um, to uh, find funders who can uh, potentially fund these questions. So lots of discussions with the Economic and Social Research Council and the NHR, the health funding body. Um, we're busy sharing the top 10 priorities with interested groups, which is what we're doing here. Um, also with groups like the Regional Improvement and Innovation Coordination Hubs. And finally, we're already using the questions to inform new initiatives across research, innovation, improvement and evidence um, informed practice. So just a couple of examples. We're working with Public Health Wales on the Network Data Lab um, to inform some of the questions there and also working with um, Susan Miles, who I know is on the call from Health Technology Wales around um, thinking about how we can propose topics for Health and Technology Wales. So sorry, Jonathan, I went half a minute over. Um, but please do get in touch if you have any questions and I will give the screen back to you, Jonathan. Thanks, Lisa. And I think, you know, that's a really good example of, of for us as an innovation network, it's so important to understand those challenges when we are looking to innovate, when we are trying to understand what are the solutions out there to plug the gaps to, to help with those, those challenges and the fact that that you've gone out and been able to kind of pull together those 10 key priority areas really gives people on the network, you know, members here today that some something to work on, something to set their uh, to set their sights on. So so it is so important to understand those challenges from the patients, the, the you know, from your your staff and, and from people who use the service. And and, and that's really valuable, I think, for, for innovation in Wales. So so thank you very much. Um, OK, fantastic. So. We're going to move on to our next speaker. So um, next we have Tom James, who is the Assistant Director of Innovation at Aniram Bevan University Health Board. And Tom's going to be talking about the NHS Wales COVID-19 Innovation Study. So over to you, Tom. Brilliant. Thanks, Jonathan. Just confirming you can all hear me OK, yeah? Sounds good. Good stuff. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, on a personal note, actually, uh, thank you for the introduction, Jonathan. Um, on a personal note, it's really good actually to reconnect um, with the innovation network, um, having been involved in the in the setup of it, you know, a couple of years ago, my previous role um, uh, in innovation in uh, for the health and social services group in Welsh government. Um, I'm my role within the Nairn Bevan University Health Board is to develop an innovation approach for the organisation. Part of that is around how we create the right conditions, the right organisational conditions to, to support and enable an innovation, how we develop an innovation approach alongside a coherent research improvement and value based healthcare approach for the organisation in line with what we're doing or, or, or what it says in Healthier Wales to better coordinate the research improvement innovation functions. Um, how do we build innovation capacity across the health board, you know, through internal and external training? Um, and I guess one of the most important things that I've been doing um, more recently is how we use learning from the COVID-19 pandemic to support the health board to embrace new ways of working and innovation. Um, and I guess that's the that, that, that's the purpose of, 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 of what I'm going to be talking to you guys about today. Um, it's a piece of work that actually started internally uh, here in Iron Bevan. So one of the things that I noticed, you know, early on in April was that 
very, very quickly, um, there were new ways of working um, a new practice springing up right across the health board in response to the completely new conditions that we were working under, how you know um, service um, services were being provided in very, very different ways. Um, and I thought it was really, really important um, to to understand and, and to capture some of that learning so so that when things went back to normal or whatever the new normal was, um, we could understand what novel and innovative practice emerged as a result of COVID-19. You know, we could demonstrate successful themes and case studies that was able that we were able to use as an evidence base to enable scale and sustain these transformative ways of working, not just across NHS Wales, but also um, across our regional partnership board partners as well. Um, I think so. So actually, what I started was an internal study um, registered with our research team to look at, you know, um, to, to ask people, what is the different stuff that you're doing now? How are you providing services in different ways? And what is some of the key learning that, that, that you've got? And actually, through through the network that I have with the with my, with my equivalents in other health boards, um, the what, what we're calling our NHS Wales Innovation Leads Group, um, we were very, very quickly able to get that study out across the other health boards and, and, and trusts in Wales. So we were quite quickly able to, to turn it into a national study. And I guess, you know, so that, that meant that we were getting a much broader variety of views. Um, we were much getting, you know, from, from, from different areas of the service, which were providing different areas, uh, sorry, which were providing services in different areas, some rural, some city, um, you know, in, in very deprived communities as well, uh, which broadened that evidence base out quite significantly. And actually, the more as as this as this uh, transformation study started to started to, to 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 gather momentum, we were we were able to get in touch with the transformation team in Welsh government who 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 were supportive, HEIW um, Health Education Improvement Wales, the Welsh NHS uh, Confederation, Healthcare Sciences Program, Allied Health Professionals, Bevan Commission we're all able to get involved and actually what ended up happening we 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 got we got funding from a number of different sources that that, that was able that we were able to commission a report based on the evidence bases that that, that, that we were that, that we were that we were looking at and actually whilst we looked at you know this this national evidence base that that uh, that we created actually what we found was there were more and more and more other local learning opportunities or local learning um reports that have been done which have now most of which have been brought into this this wider report and i guess you know what is it that we're trying to achieve so we're having a report produced on that evidence um and i guess what it is you know we're, we're trying to detail the reasons why nhs wales organizations and staff could or did innovate or or, or look at different practice during the COVID-19 pandemic. What we want to do is also offer a range of case studies that highlight innovation examples and themes that are attributed to different organisations and different practitioners in the system. Um, we want to provide recommendations for then for how NHS Wales and regional partnership board partners can sustain this innovation and transformative ways of working that have sprung up and emerged as a result of having to work under very, very different conditions um, uh, of COVID-19. And I guess, you know, um, what we can... Um, what we can do is, is 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 that helps us develop a greater understanding across the system of the reasons why staff can work in different ways to demonstrate that there is an inherent permission to apply new practice and innovation to communicate those examples of, of, of innovation to colleagues and support greater understanding about how to apply new new practice to different areas how to adopt and scale innovation which is quite often um, um, which is quite often, um, you know, attributed or, or one of the challenges of innovation. Um, just to confirm, I can see a couple of things coming through on the. I'm not clicking through slides at the moment. This is this is um, this is my own notes that I'm just running through. And I guess, you know, what we want to do is showcase NHS Wales and beyond as a leader in delivering new ways of working and innovation throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. You know what we want to be able to get is 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 is, is produce is, is a report that we can send out and give not just to leaders across NHS Wales and regional partnership board partners, but also to practitioners across the system and to help them understand you know how what other what other stuff is out there, uh, what other stuff um, you know we can learn from and how how we can best apply the, the stuff that's really good, the stuff that should stick as a result of COVID through um, uh, for, you know when whenever we get back to whatever the new normal is. Um, I guess the report will be is due to be published in March, which, um, as 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 Dee said earlier on in in the in the, um, in the introduction, is the this will coincide with 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 some life sciences uh, hub 
Life Sciences Hub Wales um, literary review of innovation. So, so actually what we'll have is a practical evidence base of what good stuff has happened as a result of COVID-19, what good learning we've got out there, accompanied with a literary review and a narrative around innovation, um, which I feel is going to be a really, really um, a powerful uh, evidence base. Um, this we hope will also feed into the development of the Innovation and Transformation um, Intensive, Le Intensive Learning Academy, which is which has been developed through Swansea um, and, and Cardiff universities, um, which will be a significant um, advancement really in terms of how we can upskill NHS Wales and regional partnership board staff um, to be able to innovate more in their day to day work. Um, I'll leave it there. I, I just a big thank you for, again for for allowing me the the opportunity to to talk about the study. And I know that um, Danielle is going to talk um, and and Tom are going to talk a little bit more about their work as well. I'll sign off here, Jonathan, but happy to answer questions a little bit later on. Thanks, Tom. Um, and again, I think you know that's a really good example of of you know the NHS and and, and social care ways having that that voice and and being able to share their experiences of innovation during what has been a really difficult time and a really um, a unique time over the past 12 months. And I think what it also highlights is, and, and, it, and, and hopes to encourage is that people aren't innovating in isolation, so people can learn from other people's experiences and, and, and develop and grow um, projects based on what other people have done and learned um, as a result of their, their project. So, um, so um, we're, gonna, we're gonna move on nicely to our, um, to our next speaker. Um, so next we have um, Tom Housen, uh, who is an uh, innovation technologist at, uh, at, for Accelerate at Swansea University Healthcare Technology Centre. And Tom's going to be now bringing us down a level into the, um, the regional partnership board um, level of, of mapping that um, he's been doing some work on um, over the past couple of months. So over to you, Tom. Wow, thanks, Jonathan. Um, I'll just share my screen now. Can everyone see this? Yeah, yes. I can see it, Tom. Yeah, fab. OK, cool. Yeah, um, thanks again for the opportunity to present here. And it's a, a great platform. I see a um, significant opportunity for developing health and social care networks and innovation projects within. Um, so my name's Tom Housen. I'm, as Jonathan said already, um, working at Sonsi University Medical School in the Health Technology Centre um, for the Accelerate programme. So I'm here today to talk to you about health and social care research, innovation and improvement ecosystem mapping we're, we're currently undertaking with a number of the RPBs in Wales. Um, I'd like to just give you a brief overview. I know it's 10 minutes, so this is a very big project to squeeze into 10 minutes. So I'll, I'll give you a brief overview of the project. Um, I'll describe the project approach, the emerging findings. I'll then show you some examples we found. And just a warning, these obviously aren't all the examples. These are just ones we picked out. And then I'll move on to describing the next steps of the research and where we we looking to go in the, in the future, I guess. So the project overview, the project. Um, basis, I guess, spans back to the findings from the Parliamentary Review on Health and Social Care in Wales, which found that the current models of service provision across health and social care are unsustainable in Wales at the moment. Um, in response, the Welsh Government, through the Healthier Wales strategy, called for significant transformation and the development of a seamless system of health and social care, which is underpinned by research, innovation and improvement activities. Um, to support Welsh Government's ambitions and this RII activity, the Welsh Government proposed the establishment of a group of research, innovation and improvement support hubs, which are now established within each RPB as, sorry, this is a bit of a mouthful, but the Research Innovation Improvement Coordination Hubs, or RIC hubs, as they'll be referred to. Um, so the aim of the project we're undertaking is to map all health and social care research innovation improvement activity at a regional and national level. And the aim of this is to inform the emerging strategy of the newly established RIC hubs. So we can inform with an evidence base where strengths and weaknesses yeah. exist within these, within these sectors, highlight and share best practice across health and social care research innovation, um, identify possible barriers and enablers to research innovation and improvement work 
and most of all, I guess, assess and identify where the RIC hub could add most value to yourselves as stakeholders within this, this realm. Um, so the project approach, it's, it's a four stage approach effectively. Um, we use a multi-layered ecosystem mapping approach. We use the term ecosystem, I think, because we find the term health and social care sectors quite restrictive, whereas ecosystems, if you refer to nature, there are, there are a number of different components all contributing to the functioning of the system. So we call this the, the research, innovation and improvement ecosystem. So this, this mapping centres on mapping of the, the stakeholders within the sector. So that's health, social care, the local authorities, academia, third sector and industry. Although the focus at the moment hasn't been so much on industry, but that will be in the following phase of this, these projects. So in order to achieve this, we aim to break this down. We first look at the assets. So the regional assets are the organisations, the people, the bodies that are able to undertake RRI in health and social care across each of the regions. We then look to map the activities these assets are undertaking. And then also we're looking at the relationships that exist between these, these assets and stakeholders within the systems to identify where there, there are gaps, where more joined up and integrated approaches could be more successful and, and drive improvement and innovation and research activity. So in order to do this, the, the four work, work packages um, include desk-based research to start, which involves just, just examining the published and internet sources. We then interact with stakeholders by surveys and semi-structured interviews. The findings and data are then analysed through three different forms of analysis, thematic analysis, geographic analysis and network mapping. And at the moment, we're currently doing with this with three of the RPBs, the regional partnership boards, um, with three further regional partnership boards looking to add in February. OK, so as I said, this is a very ongoing piece of research. So these are emerging findings at the moment. So I've just identified a number of them. So it wouldn't be a presentation in the COVID era if you didn't mention anything about COVID-19. So COVID, as I'm sure you're all aware, has been a significant driver of R&I, &I, um, particularly in the realms of technology. Um, we've identified areas of particular regional pockets of strength and weakness, which could in future with discussion adopt smart specialization approaches. So on the right hand side of your screen, you can see just examples of this. So we're looking at West Wales, in particular and and the health board research and improvement work so you can see there are there are big focuses on cancer respiratory and primary care and if you look in the graph on the bottom right you can see in 2019 uh, Hull University Health Board participated in over 40 percent of the research um, related to respiratory yet its workforce is only around 11,000 11 percent population of of the NHS Wales workforce. So you can see there's a particular strength and focus. Um, there are a number of particular barriers, including capacity. This is especially in social care domains of knowledge, time and skills to undertake research, innovation and improvement work. There are cultures that, that prevent this, funding mechanisms, bureaucracy and, and gaps within networks where people could be joined up more effectively to to produce this integrated approach to our I. &I. Uh, we believe there are significant opportunities for social care related RI support programmes, such as Accelerate Buccaneer and Calin are there for, for health, particularly at the moment. And there are also significant opportunities for industry through such as knowledge transfer partnerships. And we believe RIC, the RIC hubs could, could facilitate this and play an important way in a number of roles, which I'll explain later. So now I just aim to give you a few examples of what we found. By all means, these, these are not all of what we found. This just tries to highlight a range of sort of things. So in healthcare, we've looked at primary care RI, and there are a massive range of this, thanks to the pace setters programs and the cluster workings. So new models of care, workforce innovation, such as expanding the workforce in terms of physios in the community, occupational therapists in the community. There are new partnership approaches with GPs, with third sector organisations and, and social care and health, obviously. 
And there's, there's a number of new technologies, but also social prescribing um, activities are becoming increasingly um, prevalent across the RI landscape. In terms of secondary care, just a few projects, there's, there's been a number of digital whiteboards working with Accelerate and partners. Um, these allow the monitoring of multiple patient health outcomes and, and statuses at, at any one time. Um, we know Kuntaf Organog are currently undergoing backlog planning. So mapping alternate patient pathways for patients who are likely to be delayed in their treatment uh, due to the COVID-19 backlog. And also innovative MedEd innovation approaches. So new approaches to medical education, such as the Primary Care Academy in, in Swansea and in Cardiff, as well as the training of new roles, such as PAs and um, other supporting roles. And across social care, there are a number of new models. And these generally try to invert resource allocation. So in traditionally, a lot of these models have put a lot of resource into complex intervention, complex services and targeted intervention services, whereas prevention approaches within communities have been lacking. Um, so these are now trying to flip, flip this triangle upside down and apply the resources to prevention within communities. They're also looking to, to join adults and children's services together so there are no gaps where people fall down within. And they're also trying to look at a more holistic type of, type of service not looking at the individuals, but rather looking at the wider determinants of, of need. Um, other social care products we looked at include medicine management platforms in care homes, digital platforms by local authorities to understand the patient journeys throughout the systems, where the pinch points are, and, and how these might be um, interacted with and interventions put in place to, to stop these points. But also really interesting, simple ones, such as training of prescription delivery drivers to interact with lonely people and to identify deteriorations in their health status. So it's, it's getting into the community and, as Lisa said, um, just supporting people to keep well. Um, I know this is quite tight on time, so I'll, I'll try and rush through these. Um, so third sector, we've looked at a number of things. There's, there's a number of platforms there trying to build community resilience and there's, there's time banking schemes, schemes to support hospital discharge, such as the pivot scheme, as well as, as well as schemes to support people coming out of hospital and other facilities with mental health conditions to integrate back into the communities. Um, in terms of academia, we, we've been able to identify and, and map research particular strength of clusters. So each of these clusters relate to um, a number of activities in a particular area. So we're able to compare and contrast the different university forms, um, which allows us to identify where particularly the universities have particular strengths and, and we can direct certain projects and certain research towards those and work with them. Um, there's, in academia, there's also a lot of infrastructure development, such as the Cardiff University Innovation Campus, Swansea University's ILS expansion, and the SA1 Innovation Quarter, with University of Wales Trinity St David, along with a number of support programmes such as Accelerate, Callan and Buccaneer, and other opportunities Tom's mentioned, such as the Intensive Learning Academies, or the ILA, um, SAIL and the CIC. Um, along with this, we've also begun to, to build a picture of this health and social care ecosystem network by network mapping. And the picture is emerging of interaction between the ecosystem stakeholders. Um, some patterns appear to be saying that there's lack of industry connections with, with health and social care, but that's by no means of their fault by not trying. Um, and also there's, there's an improving landscape on health and social care um, working more closely together, but there's still room for improvement. Um, so the next steps in this in this research, um, we're working with three more RPBs over the next six months to to carry on this mapping, and and hopefully we'll be able to bring them all together in a pan Wales view of RII. Um, just one one cheap sale. It would be great to have you involved, and for us, it, we learn a lot more by interacting with you. So if you think you've got any project or anything you could share that would help with this, it'd be great to hear from you. Um, thanks again, and that's me. 
Thanks, Tom. And again, just another way, uh, it, it's really kind of, it, it's great to see uh, um, that mapping and, 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 and that, that, that data that's coming out of the, the research that you've been doing. And I think a really important point for me towards the end there about networking. And, and I think it's really important for what we're trying to do today and, and bringing people together with similar interests, similar desires and, 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 and goals. And, and how, do we, how, do we, how do we create that melting pot for innovation for people across this network and also help it build across Wales? And, and, and I think that's, that's really important. And, and how do we keep that, that momentum when we do leave this, this period of, of, of COVID and, and, and into the future? You know? So thank you very much, Tom. Really, really interesting there. Um, so we'll move on to our, our next speaker. So um, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Daniel Sapford, who's a research innovation and improvement hub manager at Powys Teaching Health Board. And uh, Danielle is going to be talking to us about the, bringing us down to the, to the local level, the health board level now, for, the, for some of the work they've been doing with their staff um, around um, COVID innovation and um, the learning that they've taken from some of their survey work. So um, over to you, Danny. Brilliant, thank you, Jonathan. Um, good afternoon, everyone, uh, and thanks for letting me join you uh, and allowing me to speak to you um, this afternoon about some of the work, some of the innovation work we've been doing in Powys. Um, over the past year, it's fair to say that COVID has absolutely necessitated the use of new innovations, new ways of working, particularly digital technologies, and it's been essential to sustain the delivery of um, health and care services. But what we wanted to do in Powys was really understand what this looked like and how it had been experienced across our workforce. So back in the summer uh, of 2020, we asked our workforce to share their experience, their observations, um, their insights, their learning about the way COVID had affected their ways of working, um, the innovations and in digital tech that were introduced or scaled up over that period. Um, and we didn't only ask about the what, but we asked about the benefits, the successes and the challenges therein. Um, and we also asked our workforce about their ideas, emphasis on the word there, their ideas based on their experiences, knowledge and learning across this period for innovations or new or improved ways of working that we should be looking to in the future. So today I'm just going to use this opportunity to um, share some of the highlights um, where that learning through that early COVID response phase has led to ideas for innovation um, that we would like to now pursue as a health board. Um, I've, only, I've chosen all the ideas and innovations that link to one specific theme um, um, that came out of that broader survey work that we've done, and that was around specifically the ways of working um, and the ways we contacted and communicated with our patients and service users. So, um, for example, um, we learned that in remote rural areas like Powys, we need to innovate and think really creatively about digital inclusion. We have real challenges around the variable internet connectivity um, and the lack of access to appropriate equipment for some people. Um, so several ideas have been proposed around upskilling, providing equipment, but also as well as looking into um, looking into our communities and exploring how we can in partnership facilitate digital access to health and care services through community spaces. So that's one of the ideas we're going to be looking into. I mean, we've learned that while there are challenges with the digital and virtual contact and communication, there are also important benefits and their added value, uh, not only to the health board, but to our to the people of Powys. Um, one of the really key things we've learned is that some people in our communities actually much prefer to connect with their health services virtually or through digital means. Um, so based on kind of the learning that's grown up around that, um, and in relation to specific areas, we have had ideas proposed around um, virtual reality and the use of avatars, um, which was identified as a preference for some of the young people accessing the psychological group therapies through our CAM service. Um, things like vo uh, virtual pulmonary rehabilitation, so that's group sessions of pulmonary rehab um, through an online platform. Um, the, loose, the use of social media um, was very welcomed by the families who use our speech and language ther therapy services. So um, that's social media to provide information and support and guidance, though not necessarily clinically specific to an individual family, but that kind of that more general support and contact. 
Um, other ideas around robotic artificial intelligence were proposed as a beneficial first point of contact and an, as an initial source of kind of information, advice and signposting for the general population. Um, we've learned that there are a lot of benefits to the people that we work with and our staff alike through activities such as virtual ward rounds. And in particular, throughout COVID, we learned the importance and the benefits of virtual visiting. It was clear that our workforce through the survey, sorry, through the survey responses and the ideas put forward, it was fundamentally clear and important to our workforce that we went to explore and test more and new ways of um, new technologies that will enable families to be able to access each other, be that outside of traditional visiting times or just when they can't be by the bedside for whatever reason. Um, just moving on, we've learned that some of our new ways of working, such as the telephone triage that we've put into our MIUs, which was an immediate response to COVID, is actually showing benefit and that has that has relevance beyond a pandemic situation. So it's very effective in managing footfall, uh, ensuring attendance at the MIU is actually appropriate and where it's not appropriate, people are being redirected to the services that will better meet their needs before they even arrive at the MIU door. So this, you know, things like this will not only have potential in the MIU beyond the pandemic, but actually may, it's a model that may be suitable for scale across other services. Another thing that we've learned through COVID is that self-care has really increased among the people of Powys. Staff have reported observing increased motivations um, and it's been expressed by some of the people that we work with and our service users that they have themselves found themselves to be more capable of self-care than they had previously thought. And it's been, been very clear that it's really important not only to our staff but to the people of Powys that we really build on these motivations and we really enable these capabilities. And there's been a lot of ideas that have been proposed um, for uh, innovations and technologies that might be able to support this, including personal wearable, wearables, um, uh, telehealth, the provision of remote or self-monitoring equipment, apps, devices, BP monitors, those kinds of things. And I guess fundamentally throughout the pandemic, we in Powys have learned not to fear to do things differently. Um, and this has really become very clear in some of the new innovative ways of working that we are currently looking into and testing around drive through services, um, for example, for spirometry and for, for, for phlebotomy clinics. OK, I know that was just a very brief whistle stops tour, just some of the ideas that have been put forward um, as a result of what we've learned from COVID. Um, there's many more innovations and new ways of working that have been proposed and we're currently working our way through those. But just before I finish, I just wanted to share with you some of the progress that we've made against some of these ideas. Um, and it's worth flagging that in almost all the all these cases for ideas, the very first step in that progress has been to engage with other organisations to develop partnerships. Um, for example, um, we've worked with Powys County Council to develop and implement a chatbot, with, uh, an AI robotic programme that is, um, uh, that is helping meet the increased demands amongst our staff for IT support that have come about within this pandemic situation because of the increased use of technology and the new technologies that have come on board. Um, another example we have uh, in collaboration with other health boards and with the University of South Wales um, uh, developed, <coughs> excuse me, uh, developed a proposal and submitted a bid um, for another another AI robotic technology, but this one is really to work alongside and support our prevention agenda. Um, and we are, with support from the Life Sciences Hub, uh, developing partnerships, horizon scanning for proven innovations from elsewhere that we can test um, and adapt and adopt in Powys. Um, and these kinds of things that I'm referring to are wearable technologies. Uh, our two priority areas here are for minimising the falls risks and, app, and looking at things like apps for managing diabetes. Um, we're looking at tech and industry outside of health and care and possible solutions from other places that might actually help um, provide solutions to some of the needs we've identified. Uh, as I mentioned previously, um, a virtual reality avatars for our CAM service users to engage remotely in psychological therapy. Well, we've found that there are similar products already in use in education. So we're kind of looking towards products that are already proven to see if we can um, test in our particular circumstances. 
And we've also got a couple of our own homegrown innovations that have developed over the last year, um, new ways of working uh, that we are either in um, the, the, the early test phase or we're just coming to the end of our very initial pilots. And that's our virtual pulmonary rehabilitation and our drive through spirometry. Um, and of course, once all that evaluation evidence, that data is, is compiled, that will be ready to share um, share much more widely for any any other areas, any other sectors that might be used, uh, might be interested in these kind of model, models or or um, anything similar that we can where we can share that learning. Um, anyway, I'll draw draw to a close there. Obviously, happy to take any questions. Um, and thank you. Back to Jonathan. Thanks, Danny. And 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 I know we've 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 spoken about your your survey work in the past, but I think. It's, this is a really good example of how connecting with the staff is so important around innovation and I think developing the culture around innovation and, and how people see it as an opportunity rather than a challenge for, for developing the services for their patients. Um, and I think in Powys where that, that rural aspect to the, to the, you know, to the, to the area is really important for, for, for the staff for you for, for trying to improve the services that, that their patients kind of receive. Um, so thank you to all our speakers that, you know, there's, I, I, I really hope you've, you've enjoyed that. And, and, and I, I know I have, and it's been really good to kind of get that, that first of all, as we would in innovation to, to kind of set the scene with the challenges and really understand what we're trying to do and why we're trying to do it. And then breaking it down over a national, regional and local level to kind of really pick out what are the kind of key, um, challenges but also the opportunities and, and, and activity that's happening in Wales. So um, we're going to move to some questions and um, they've been coming through thick and fast through the, the chat function. Um, I'm kind of doing multiple screens at the moment so uh, do bear with me while I, I pick some of those out. So, um, so um, I think We've got a question. I suppose this really applies to all of you, but um, I think it was particularly for Lisa and it was um, from Charlotte just talking about how will all the work that, that um, you've been doing, Lisa, can, how will that be fed into the, the RPB, so the regional partnership boards, so that it's translated into practical change rather than just remaining at a high level, um, at high level profile? Thanks, Jonathan. Um, so so th this kind of has two strands so the the formal part of this work was really to help health and care research wales identify questions they could then get funding for um but as part of the research and development strategy you people may not be aware that there's a social care research and development strategy um which is on our website um our big thing is about supporting people in the sector to use evidence and obviously this is just another form of evidence around how we should be prioritizing or could be prioritizing so we are um trying to reach out as much as we can essentially um i've talked to jason linton's about um, presenting to all of the regional improvement and innovation hubs, but we are very much up for sharing this information as widely as possible and, and certainly with directors of social services. Um, but if there is an audience in the RPBs that you think would, would um, benefit from hearing, get in touch and we'd be very happy to go and present or, or present virtually or send more information. So we, we are keen that this is shared as widely as possible um, so that it, it has a, a much bigger life than just informing research funding. Thanks, Jonathan. And, and Lisa, while, I, while I've got you there, um, so your, your partnership with the James Lind Alliance, um, so a question's come in from Mark I. Davis just about, do you feel that that kind of helped you focus in your, around the, these challenges and really focus the efforts then over the past 12 months? Yeah, I mean, it's a, an absolutely superb process. It's so systematic, but also, um, you know, what's really important is that point I made on one of the early slides about how it doesn't give uh, preference to any particular voice. It, um, you know, it's a very inclusive process. And we also went to great lengths to reach out to people who are seldom listened to, you know, gypsy and um, gypsy and traveller communities and um, LGBTQI communities and tried to um, make sure that we 
had as good a representat representation as possible. What I would say, so the formal um, priority setting partnership that JLA do is a, an 18 month process. And I'm not entirely sure how much it is, but I know it's, um, it's quite um, famously expensive. Um, the process that we went through was, um, we called it in association with the James Lind Alliance and it took seven months. And I think it came in, we, we had a half a, um, half a full-time project manager and it came in at about 15,000. So it's not, not a cheap process. You don't embark on it um, without a, a good reason. But in terms of the systematic process of setting priorities, I would highly recommend it, um, particularly if you want to make sure you get a good span of voices and, and really build some consensus around priorities. So highly recommend it, yes. Brilliant, thank you. Tom James, I can see you've got your hand up. Yeah, yeah, I just uh, wanted to say really that actually and building a little bit on what some of the stuff that Lisa said is about we really, really want the the evidence coming out of the, the, the innovation and transformation study to be applicable across regional partnership board partners as well. So it's not just about you know, the, the, you know, these things are for the NHS, whilst some stuff that comes out of the report and, and the evidence base will be, you know, distinct to NHS organisations and, and, the, and the services that only NHS organisations do. Actually, some of the lessons and the learning and the recommendations will be applicable to across the public sector more generally. Um, and I think, you know, we've got to look beyond, you know, beyond health boundaries to health and social care boundaries in line with what a healthier world suggests, which is a, a long term plan for health and social care. And that's what distinguishes the Welsh um, strategy over over others, I think. Thank you, Tom. Um, so I'm kind of moving, I'm moving down the questions in order as they came in through the chat. But um, so um, we've got a question or, or a point really just about any of the backlog planning or exercises that look at alternative pathways, journeys for better care for patients should consider collecting proms. Um, and that's coming from one of our Value in Health uh, team members. Um, is this something that's on the radar for any of you as 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 you've been kind of going through this journey of understanding the, the innovations that are taking place in Wales. Um, Can I, oh, sorry, sorry go Tom. <laughs> I'm going to jump in for social care, um, as, as you would expect. Um, and, and just to make the comment that um, we, we love your, your lovely health version of value-based healthcare and, and the idea that outcomes are important. I, I think we, we would all stress that it's, you know, 20 or 30 years in social care since we adopted outcomes as, as a good way of measuring quality, in inverted commas, or at least experiences. So um, I, I would point out that um, you know, if people are interested in how we have gone about doing this in social care, there's a rich literature um, about the challenges of um, of identifying attribution or even contribution in social care because it is such a wide ranging set of care and support. So um, I am just going to put in a a just a point that um, that the two things exist in both health and social care, but in very very different ways. Um, so I just wanted to make that point for anybody who's not familiar with some of the stuff that's happened in social care over the years. Sorry, Tom. No, that's all right, Lisa, ladies first always. Um, I think uh, I, I think it's an important point to, you know, whilst I, I'm not going to respond directly to problems in, in the work that I do, um, I think the, 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 the point about how we focus on value in healthcare and value being patient outcomes, patient experience and resource efficiency as well. Um, I, I think it's just such, such an important um, aspect of the work that we do. And if we can't tie it back to value, then I think, we, you know, we should be looking at how we can do it differently. Um, and, I'm, and I'm really hopeful that whilst it, it, the, the, the innovation study won't, won't focus specifically on PROMS, I, I, I suspect, I, I would really want the value to be in, 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 an intrinsic part of how we focus the report um, in order to focus on value and to make sure that we're getting value from the things that we're doing. Brilliant. Thank you, Tom. Um, I'm going to have a bit of a presenter's privilege here and ask, and ask a question myself, but um, I suppose it, it's just going off the back of, um, you know, the work that you've done, Lisa, with, with your, your service users. And and I think it's it's to all it's all speakers really. And, and how important is it that not only are you know you users and staffing included in not only identifying the challenges but also 
the the development stages of innovation you know the the feedback phases and and and, and also um you know in, in the embedding and the the adoption of of innovation you know how important is that in in the success for for innovation in wales and across health and social care so if anyone wants to to, to go first um I'm happy to jump in there. I actually think it's it's crucial, uh, Jonathan. One of the big things actually has become very apparent to us because obviously we did the our piece, our primary piece of work with our workforce to understand their experiences and their knowledge. But what we're now actually in development, what we're planning um, to start up in the next. Uh, well, hopefully by April it'll be up and ready, is actually to do a very similar exercise, but with the population of Powys, we want to understand what's important to them. Um, we understand the based on the population needs assessment where the sort of the, the priority areas are or should be um, from that perspective. But actually, um, it's really important to us now, um, not only just around innovation, but with a similar line of inquiry around research, because they're slightly different um, timescales and slightly different kind of approaches. Um, also quality improvement as well that can be thrown in there, but actually understanding what is important to them um, and and really understanding what works and what doesn't for the people of Powys is also critical um, and you can't do that without a proper engagement um, and one you know once kind of the the ideas that we need to pursue are, are properly established that's when we also need to you know right the way through from that that finding out that development of the idea stage right the way through um, it, it, even on the evaluation um, team it's essential for us to have people the people of Powys on board with us all the way so that's really what we're focusing on in this next year is actually developing the infrastructure to enable that brilliant thank you Danny uh Tom Housen yeah I guess I, I, I guess I I echo what Danny says the the incorporation of of patients and service users is a critical aspect to get to get in innovation well user-friendly innovation I think there are a number of we've identified a number of um, activities across Wales that that look to do this, but that could also be built in much more effectively pan Wales in in these sort of programs. Lisa, I'm sure we'll be able to talk more about the Enrich program, which involves um, care homes and their integration in research, innovation, improvement activities, but also using patients in in programs such as the Education for Patients program, which patients themselves within communities identify challenges that that they face within within primary and secondary care and social care services and i think we really need to think about how we can start using these sources of information more effectively and almost communicating them to the wider to the wider ecosystem as well so you could get that more integrated and challenge focused approach from from patients themselves Brilliant. thanks tom uh, lisa yeah, I um, we come from a slightly different perspective in social care. Um, if you think about the nature of social care and how it's supposed to promote independence and well-being, um, everything is so intensely co-produced. So, so the idea that the voice of the person with lived experience is even separate is a bit of a non-starter. So, I think in healthcare, you, you know, even though we're very focused on person-centred care and very focused on outcome measures these days. Um, you know, traditionally, you could get away with being not that patient centred, you know, you could administer the prescription or the x-ray or whatever. But social care is so different. Um, everything has to put the voice of the person with lived experience at the centre. And in fact, that's what the Social Services and Wellbeing Act is intended to do. It's all about outcomes. It's all about what matters. It's not about how services should be designed. It's about what support people want and need. So, so I, I Sue, I think Denman put a, a comment in the uh, side and I'd, I'd utterly um, uphold that, you know, so that's all the way through, whether it's research or delivery or design, um, the, the voice of the person with lived experience for us is absolutely key to everything. And I, and I think this is where this as a network and as members, this is where we can learn from each other. You know, if, if social care have been, uh, are, are quite mature in that space of, of involving uh, service users in how they develop services. And, and, you know, that is a perfect example of how we can learn from each other about some of these skill sets and some of the ways we approach that. Um, so I'm going to uh, one of the questions again, which has come through and I'm, I'm probably rewording it slightly, but is is just about how each of you may be 
have engaged with industry about some of these these challenges or some of the, the approaches to innovation and what your experience of that has been. Um, yeah, so I don't know if anyone's got any thoughts um, or any comments around that. Uh, Tom James. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think we, we talked at, at the, the technical briefing actually uh, before the meeting started. We, we talked a little bit about, you know, what what successes we had seen in, in terms of working with industry. Um, they have been um, as a result or, or during COVID-19. And I think actually, you know, the, the fact that to point to a good example, you know, where the life sciences have sort of support the NHS is where you've taken and 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 held the ring for for some of the procurement of PPE for us. Because actually, and I, and I, and I said this before, so apologies to the to the panel, but the you know every man and his dog were emailing me at one point at the start of the pandemic to say that they had PP or to offer PP or to try and find out about PP and actually to be able to kind of focus those to one point in the system which was linked up you know and, and through the life sciences hub and NHS World Shared Services Partnership um, actually that that's just a fantastic example of where you bring you, you bring it through one one um pipe if you like and then you filter out the the the, the good stuff and the bad or not the bad stuff or the, the stuff that's not appropriate and and it, and it takes that burden off the nhs it gives the nhs a, a, a real solution and i think actually i think the hub has got a real role to play in in supporting the nhs to do that and to do more of that you know and which ultimately comes back to and i guess it you know so we, we talk it in, in one perspective about patient centered care and what the patient want or, or what the customer wants but if, if you like so but but we it, i guess when we talk about innovation it means what is the clinical need that we're trying to fix here and why would we work with someone else so, so the re, you know, if we have a clinical need and we need to work with someone else, just because we don't have or necessarily have the capability to do that ourselves or the capacity to do that ourselves. So, I think the, it, what we know in the NHS is that we know the areas in which we can do different things. To have some sort of um, a, a resource or a solution provided in, say, for example, that you know the the industry bought for the life sciences hub to to say where we say we want to work with an AI um, company or we want to work with a company that can help us to redesign a particular pathway, you know, and use data in a different way. That's the sort of thing I think we we we, we could really use, particularly in NHS and and the public sector to as as that kind of brokerage between NHS uh, or, or or public sector and industry. And Tom Housen. You're on mute, Tom. Sorry again. Um, just to echo Tom's point again, that um, voice everything he says, and, and just to put Accelerate's flag in the ground to you as well. We we are a programme that's designed to work with industry and sit between academia and the health service and social care services to co-produce those products in, in R&D collaboration forms. So, we're here and the, the gates always open for us to work with industry and we found that industry often possess many of the skills um health and social care sectors and staff don't have they don't have the time maybe not the finance or the skills in terms of bringing things to market so yeah it's just just to say the accelerate projects there and i'm welcoming any any industry partnerships that that are out there awesome thank you tom and and you know for me and oh um you know, from a life sciences hub point of view, you know, um, I think Tom makes a really Tom James makes a really good point, and 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 that is our role. You know, we are here to try and encourage and the the adoption and you know and spread of innovation across Wales, and we we have a a really good relationship with industry, and we are here to to kind of collate and and work with partners to come together, and and you know that is our role. That is that is why we are here is to support the health board, support uh, support health and care. Um, to be innovative and to to work with innovative partners. Um, so and and you know um, and if there's anyone in the uh, on the call today who who wants to get in contact with us to try and um, to start that discussion, then we're we're very welcome. We you know we're very welcome to that. So um, we've run out of time on the questions, but um, we're going to really work hard to we're going to pull all the questions off the chat and we're going to we're going to work with the speakers to see if we can answer them as best as we can. And then we'll send those out. We'll send the answers out to everyone who's asked questions into the network uh, to have all the members. Um, so we're going to have a little bit of a change of pace now. And um, 
we really want to kind of get you involved in um in in in, in for us as 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 um hosting the the network we we want to hear from you about how the network can can really develop now that we're kind of sitting in this virtual um world and you know historically we would have met in us in in a, in a in a space and we would have had coffee and had the chance to network and chat around some of the presentations but it's a lot harder to do that in this kind of space these days um so um it's you know when we um you know i suppose what i'm trying to say is that um you know it's this is how we now interact with each other and, and you know with all the benefits that platforms like microsoft teams and zoom bring there are still gaps around how we interact and how we connect um, with each other and, and with those who are both in and, and outside our network. So it's really important for us to understand um, how we can develop the innovation network and, and how it continues to meet the, your needs as members um, as we work through probably is what, gonna be, what is going to be a blended approach to, to how we can host the network in the future. So um, we're going to move to, to, to trial in um, Menti now. So, um, for those of you who haven't used Menti before, it's an online polling platform. Um, so if you've got your phones handy, or if you're if you're using a separate screen like I am, um, you can pull up a separate web browser, um, and you can see uh, Priya, thank you very much, has just brought up the um, the code that you'll need. So if you go to menti.com, so that's M-E-N-T-I dot com, and put in the code forty three fifty eight forty nine three. Um, you should um, find yourself with the Innovation Network for Health and Social Care um, screen coming up. Um, so we'll, I'll wait a little bit just to kind of give people a chance to go on. Um, so we're just going to ask you a few questions and we're just going to kind of get your, your a, a bit of a feel for what the network, are, uh, as members, your, your thoughts are on some of the ideas that we've had about how we can kind of develop the network and, and mix it up a little bit for future meetings to try and encourage um, some interaction and some some engagement across the, the membership. So, don't forget that if you are on social media, we we um, we are using the hashtag LSHW Innovation. Um, and um, so, I'm just trying to keep eye on the chat as well. So, yeah, if you if there are any conversations, I haven't had a chance to look at my. Um, my Twitter feed just yet, but if you are keeping, if you are adding to that, then it'd be great to see those conversations keep going. Okay, so let's get started. So, um, has everyone had a chance to to kind of um, to get on there? And and so I'm going to share my screen. If that's okay. Okay. So can everyone see the, the holding slide for the Innovation Network for Health and Social Care? Yes. Can anyone give me a verbal? Yeah. 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 Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, so, um, so if I move things along, so we're going to move to the first question and what this is asking is what we're trying to get at is what were the reasons you signed up to be part of the innovation network what made you join what were the things that kind of got you here today and what what is it about an innovation network that kind of gets you to these events or to the to these meetings um and you're going to have the chance to put a, a number of different words in there and what we'll see is a word cloud come up and for those of you who haven't used this before what we'll see is that the the, the, the popular words are the ones that come out most frequently will be um, larger and in bold and, and the, you know, the, the ones that are uh, kind of smaller uh, that aren't coming up so frequently will be kind of in um, less bright colors and, and kind of smaller in size. So as I would have expected, we, we're seeing a range of different reasons coming up. So we're getting things like innovation, so networking, collaboration, learning, what else have we got there? Partnerships, technology, inspiration, practical ideas. Yeah. And, and I think what we've got to appreciate is that there will be those of you who are on different different parts of your innovation journey. And whether that is 
you know, actually working in innovation or uh, different levels of innovation. So it, it is really important to us that we really do try to appeal to, to everyone across the network um, based on their skill set or actually the experience they have of working in this space. So, you know, that's this is great, you know, and I think some of those top things coming out there for me that are jumping out at me are collaboration, networking and learning. And I think, you know, um, as a as a, this moves us perfectly on to the to the next point, and I think Tom Tom Housen made a really good point about the importance of networks, and I think it's it's massively important when we're talking about something like innovation, when we do have many sectors coming together, where that multidisciplinary approach to innovation is so important to improve the success and the and and the delivery of innovation across Wales. So. Thank you very much for kind of putting all your thoughts into that. And um, I don't know about everyone else, but there were kind of three that are jumping out at me there, not to kind of um, take any shine off the others. But we'll move on to the next question. So um, this is where we kind of want to look at some new ideas. You know, this is a new space for us in, uh, even though we've all been doing it for a bit of time, it's really important to us that we keep things fresh and, 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 it, and it appeals and it works and keeps people moving. So, you know, what thing, what, different features might encourage you to interact with the other members who are at the network events or at the network meetings and we've kind of and people are going for it fantastic so we've got things like um access to a meeting list prior to the meetings or you know we've got digital business cards or pre-event social media discussions now this isn't a full you know a, a complete list and if anyone's got any additional ideas to how we might do this and for me this is kind of like the wraparound to these events and to these meetings about how can we we keep this engagement, this interaction, both before and after um, we meet, um, you know, in in this kind of for, in, on this platform like Microsoft Teams. So um, again, just from just looking at the screen, there seems to be a lot of popularity around um, having access to the meeting list, attendee list, and I think, you know, um, similarly to if we were going to a conference and. Um, as a team, you know, we talked about going to conferences and checking who's on the list to see who we want to kind of go and talk to or engage with. So um, it's kind of really uh, great to see that. And these are some some of these ideas and some that might come out of the chat are ones that we will look to try and, you know, um, and, you know, add as threads to some of the future events as we move forward. So great. Um, OK, so we'll move on to the next phase. So the next one is just looking at within meeting kind of opportunities and, and you know, these are just, again, some examples, um, but which of these kind of networking formats would you like to see featured at future net, um, network meetings? And we've got things like facilitate the lead breakout rooms. We've got things like, um, so I've just seen someone, you know, topic focused breakout rooms, skills swap shops and social media takeover. And that may be where members take over the, the, the brunt of the discussion within social media um, or skill based activity sessions. And again, you know, we're just looking for ideas around which which of these really appeal to um, to you as members to, and, and which you feel would encourage those network that networking in that engagement and facilitate that collaboration and facilitate those connections that if we look back to the first slide about were important things for why people have come to join the network. Okay, so I don't know why uh, skills-based activities in white. It doesn't make it easier for us to see, but we can see that we've got a number there. And again, if there, if people have experiences of doing things at other events or other meetings that have really helped them connect and engage with other people on the call, then feel free to put it in the chat. You know, this is a this is a learning curve for all of us, and we just want to be able to make these meetings as meaningful and um, opportunistic and valuable to all of you because we know. That it's, everyone's time is so valuable. So we really want to try and make sure that we're the network in this format, you know, as we are virtual now, can continue to kind of offer up those opportunities and those development um, uh, scenarios for everyone. OK. Wonderful. So I can see the chat is also going a bit bonkers. Uh, next to me, so I'm going to. Johnny's still 
Right, can, can anybody hear me? Yes, yes. Can see you. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. So it's always good to have a backup plan, isn't it, with these technical times? So um, apologies there. John was doing such a great job. Um, I was in the background then feeding them the information like because I wanted to select more than one of those five um, options there as well. So um, bear with us on that. I was just messaging him behind. And um, Priya, can we um, pick up um, the next slide, please? And Jonathan can join us as he's able to. Sorry about that, everyone. I managed to just take myself off Microsoft Teams, which is that's uh, okay. Are you back, John? Because obviously you're in charge of the slides. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, um, so we we'd actually come to the to the final bit of that um, perfectly timed to that mentee uh, question. So, thank thank you to everyone for kind of taking part in that. And um, we do find Menti just keep you know is a really good way for kind of getting everyone involved in in, in discussions and and points around that. Um, so um, we've we've come to the end of the session actually, and it, um, we've 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 kind of gained a little bit of time. Um, so I'd just like to thank everyone, and you know, both everyone for kind of coming today and and taking time out of their busy days to come to the to the meeting today. And I really hope everyone's enjoyed and 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 you know had learned some new things and had the chance to kind of touch base with old uh, old connections. And I'd really like to thank our presenters, and I think they did a fantastic job of really drawing together where Wales is at from not only innovation, but some of the challenges that we have moving forward for our health and social care system. Um, and it's definitely given me some some food for thought as a, in my role as a health and care engagement manager at Life Science Sub Wales. So um, we are looking forward to having another the next meeting in spring and um, we hope to be bringing the data up uh, very soon and with that information we'll be sharing um, pre presentations from today information on how you can come you can go back to and watch the recording of the session and um, and we'll also be kind of sending out any links that have been discussed within the the chat or within the the presentations today um, if you've been having any conversations on social media, then you know please continue that, and you know it'd be great to see those conversations keep going. Um, like I said earlier, Life Sciences Hub Wales are here. If if anyone has anything that they want to touch base with us about, whether it's a, a product, an innovation, or or again anything, um, want to talk about how we connect um, challenges with innov innovative products, then please do get in touch. Um, and. Yeah, thank you very much. And I hope you've all enjoyed. Um, we do look forward to seeing you over the next couple of months, whether that's working with you on an individual basis or, or as organisations. Um, and we look forward to seeing you in the next spring network meeting. So um, have a great afternoon. And um, yeah, thank you very much for coming.
Hi all. Um, I don't know if the speakers are still on here. I can see some of the speakers are still on the call. Shall we um, revert back to the previous link? Uh, yeah, yeah, let's do that. Let's, let's Perfect. Do that. We'll see okay. you there. See you in a minute.